Good afternoon. I believe we have some Marylanders in the house. I want to first, um, as I told Susan Rice as she was leaving, we miss her on Capitol Hill. But I think her comments about the strengths of the students that we saw here in Washington, we've seen around the nation, really gives us hope. Because despite what the Congress might think or the President might think, the power in this country are with the people. And our students will not be silenced, and they want adults to act as adults. I want to thank uh, J Street and congratulate you on your 10th anniversary. Ten years, 70 years for Israel, when Harry Truman made that courageous decision in 1948 against the advice of his own State Department to recognize the State of Israel. He did that because he understood the, our two nations shared common values. And that special relationship has been strong ever since because of the fundamental principles of democracy embedded in our country and in Israel, shared values, recognizing that is the strength of America and the strength of Israel. It has been mutually beneficial to both Israel and the United States. We both benefit from that relationship, clearly on the sharing of intelligence information. John F. Kennedy said, Israel was not created in order to disappear. Israel will endure and flourish. It is the child of hope and the home of the brave. It can neither be broken by adversaries nor demoralized by success. It carries the shield of democracy and it honors the sword of freedom. President Kennedy was talking about the state of Israel, but in reality he was also talking about the United States of America, that special bond between two democratic countries. That relationship, that relationship goes beyond any individual leader or policy. The founding principles of J Street, 10 years ago, support for the people in the state of Israel, respectful debate, a responsibility to speak out against the policies of Israel or the United States that are not consistent with our Jewish and democratic values. You have stayed true to that mission. When the Prime Minister of Israel accepts an invitation to address the joint session of Congress, creating a partisan division in our own country, we speak out against that decision. When President Trump reacts to the tragedy in Charlottesville, equating those that were there to preach hate, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, with those that were there to protest that message, we speak out. When the Prime Minister of Israel takes steps that compromises refugees that are in dear risk of their own lives or crosses the line on how he handles protests in his own country, we speak out.
And when President Trump immigration policies that tries to tell the world that we have certain religion that we don't want here in America, or people from certain countries because of their demographics that we don't want here in America, or that dreamers are not welcome here in America. We speak out. The special bond between the United States and Israel goes beyond any one individual. When the leader of Israel or the United States does things that do not represent the founding principles of their country, we need to be prepared to continue to speak out. This is part of the responsibility of true allies. But we must be strategic in our actions to maintain the broad understanding and support within our political system for the people and state of Israel. And we have been successful in doing that. Just take a look at recent action in Congress. $3.1 billion in foreign military financing provided by the Congress of the United States. $700 million in missile defense for Iron Dome and David Sling and other technologies. Anti tunnel technology that we share between the United States and Israel because we both have problems on tunnels and the support for Israel within the international community. Israel needs the United States to speak out when it is being discriminated against in the international forum. It was Abba Ibn, one of the great diplomats, statesmen of Israel, who observed that if the United Nations General Assembly had a resolution declaring that the earth was flat and that Israel had flattened it, it would pass by a vote of 164 to 13 with 26 abstentions. <laughs> with all the challenges that Israel is facing today, it's more important than ever that we work to strengthen the partnership between our two countries. The rise of nationalism, fueled by anti-migrant sentiment, is on the rise throughout the world. Poland, Hungary, Turkey, NATO allies, all now have within their government those who are espousing nationalist sentiments and anti-immigrant sentiments. We saw in Poland just recently the passage of a law that tries to criminalize the ability to comment on what happened in Poland during World War II. I just want to emphasize there was a poll that came out yesterday that the millennials in the United States, two out of three, don't know what Auschwitz is about. We need to remember our history, and we can't let those who want to reinvent what happened before get away with their lives. Make no mistake about it. In democratic countries in Europe, we're seeing the rise of attacks against their own democratic institutions from within. We have not seen that since before World War II. We all need to be concerned about it. And in Germany, which has been pretty strong in dealing with its past, the alternative party, the extreme party, now has seats in their parliament. And quite frankly, the international rise of nationalism has been given oxygen by the actions of President Trump. His comments in Charlottesville allow those who espouse hate to think they have a friend. And his anti-immigrant language has made the comments which we see in Europe 
seem like it's legitimate by the world's greatest democratic power. As a result, we see the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world. I'm proud to be the special representative of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Parliamentary Assembly for anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance, and also the ranking Senate member of the Helsinki Commission. In that capacity, I have urged a concrete policy to fight anti-Semitism by actions, giving action to our words so that we can show what is needed. It starts with leadership. It starts with world leaders speaking out against any form of hate. It also involves education and making sure our young people understand. The best programs are those jurisdictions that have included strong education on tolerance. And interfaith connections are critically important, particularly between the Muslim and Jewish communities. We need to underscore those relationships. Steven, Steven Spielberg said, as a Jew, I am aware of how important the existence of Israel is for all survival of all of us. And because I am proud of being a Jew, I worry about the growing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in the world. We need to pay attention. Never again. We need to pay attention. The isolation of Israel is real. Throughout history, there have been governments and communities that have always found a reason to be anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist. They want to deny the legitimacy of the sovereignty of the state of Israel, questioning its legitimacy in a part of the world dominated by people of other religions. Forty years ago, the United States Congress recognized that threat as Arab boycotts started to appear by other countries that tried to use their economic power to cripple Israel's economic survival. And the United States Congress acted 40 years ago, so protecting Israel's sovereignty with the strength of the U.S. economy, recognizing that we could use our economy to prevent Israel from being isolated. Efforts in the United Nations to circumvent that 40-year-old boycott law are now underway protecting U.S. companies from being coerced to comply with a foreign country's decision to boycott U.S. allies. I authored legislation to try to correct that through actions being taken by international organizations, primarily the United Nations Human Rights Council. You may have heard about it. It's had some controversy. I understand that. But I want to address what that legislation is aimed at doing. It's aimed at preventing the economic pressure on Israel to affect its sovereignty by pressuring U.S. companies to do what they don't want to do. Two points have come up during that debate. One, will we protect the freedom of speech and opinion? I can tell you I have spent my entire political career defending the First Amendment rights. I strongly believe that anyone who wants to criticize Israel or wants to boycott Israel or wants to encourage others to boycott Israel, I think you're wrong, but you have your constitutional right to do that. And we're going to make sure that that is protected. The other issue, which is equally passion for me, is that I believe that we should not take sides, in fact, we have taken sides, against how settlements have been unhelpful for Israel's long-term survival. I want to make sure that we don't do anything in this bill 
that would compromise the traditional view of this country in regards to Israel's settlements. So we have tried to modify the bill, and we're still working with it. But I tell you, it's becoming more and more timely because American companies are receiving letters from the United Nations Human Rights Council questioning whether they are doing business in Israel for the purposes of advertising a boycott against those countries, companies that do not respond. Let us work together to figure out a way to protect the freedom of speech, protect the legitimate concerns of all parties, but to protect American businesses from being bullied into boycotting Israel. We can do this together. I believe, I believe in our international organizations. I'm a strong supporter of the United Nations. I think it's an extremely important organization and I've always supported it. I am very concerned about President Trump's policies of America first because to me it's America alone and that's not what this country needs to do. So let me give you one concrete example and that is the threat of Iran. I listened to Susan Rice's presentation and I agree almost with everything she said. Iran is a very dangerous country. We know that. Israel knows that. America knows that. And that's why we negotiated a Iran nuclear agreement. I agree with Secretary Rice. That was the deal with the nuclear aspects. Now, in dealing with that, many of you are aware that it was a close call for me whether to support that agreement or not. It was. I came down on the side that it should have dealt stronger on a length of time. But once it was signed and put into effect, and with Iran complying with that agreement, I think it would be so much against the United, Nation, United States national security interests if the president were to reimpose sanctions against Iran while Iran is in compliance with that agreement. And I will continue to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. This is a dangerous strategy that isolates the United States. You heard Susan Rice tell you all the reasons. Let me add one more that is pretty current. General Dunford, our Joint Chief, said, unless there is a material breach, would have an impact on any other country's willingness to sign agreements with America. If we walk away from this agreement, besides giving Iran the ability to go back to its nuclear program, besides all the isolation of America from our European allies and all that, why does the president think we could enter into diplomacy with North Korea? Who would trust America's agreements moving forward, particularly when it has been embodied in the Security Council resolution? It is counterproductive to U.S. national security. And now when this national security team has replaced General McMaster with John Bolton and is in the process of getting Director Pompeo as Secretary of State, there won't be any backup in the national security team for America to join the international community in dealing with major diplomatic challenges. We have to speak out. The, the theme of your conference is a voice for today, a vision for tomorrow. The greatest challenge is peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I understand Susan Rice's analysis. We all understand that. But there's only one course for peace in Israel. Only one option. Two states, a Jewish state of Israel, a Palestinian state, living side by side in peace. That's the only option. The, 
the United States is beyond any one person. The United States must be a facilitator of those talks. We're the only country that has the capacity to bring this about. One of the great opportunities I've had in life is to be with Shimon Perez on several occasions, first in the 1970s, and listen to his vision for Israel and its neighbors. He understood the two-state solution. He understood the aspirations of Palestinians and the Israelis. And he recognized that by having peace and opening up the Middle East to prosperity, that it would be a lasting peace. Because what people want is an economic future for their children and grandchildren. And opening up peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians will lead to that. Shimon Peres said, Israel welcomes the wind of change and sees a window of opportunity. Democratic and science-based economics by a, by a nation desires peace. Israel does not want to be an island of affluence in an ocean of poverty. Improvements in our neighbors' lives means improvement in our neighborhoods in which we live. Shimon Perez understood that Israel's future is in, strictly linked to the Palestinians living in peace and prosperity. We can make that happen. We must, we must make that happen. So that vision for tomorrow includes the U.S.-Israel special relationship remaining one of our most important friendships in the world, anchored by shared values, common goals, an appreciation for history and learning from history towards a brighter future. I thank J Street and I thank each one of you for devoting your energies to accomplishing that cause. Thank you.